<laughs> well, I do, but I don't want this part to be recorded, as we are fitting. No, no, we're good. Okay, so how do we switch because to the next Because we can go slide? and do copying. And, uh, no, no, but we need to know how to switch to the next No, 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 no
where you want to replace simply continuous maps, uh, which your view is by some combinatorial descriptions. So typically, it could be simplicial complex, or it could be cubical complex, or it could be um, a complex where instead of simplices or cubes, you have direct products of simplices as building cells and combinatorial rules of how to put them together. That's something uh, just locally combinatorial. But in, in this area, more important is that they're also globally combinatorial, which means that uh, not only you have uh, simple gluing rules, but also you have an enumeration and indexing of all of the cells which you have in your complex. And you have some sort of combinatorial description of what they are. Um, moreover, the way these uh, cells are put together is also described as a combinatorial rule. So as an example, um, we could have, uh, for example, uh, let's say we have a graph and we have um, all graph colorings. Uh, let's say we fix a certain number of colors which you want to use, which is large enough, so they actually exist. And we could have all graph colorings as vertices. And then we could have um, higher dimensional cells glued in according to how these uh, colorings interact with each other. So we could start by gluing in an edge between two uh, graph colorings as they differ in one vertex and continue with gluing in higher dimensional cells, which will be direct products of simplices to reflect some sort of commuting relation between this uh, graph colorings. It would be a typical example of a combinatorial cell complex, uh, which have been used, for example, in uh, studying graph colorings and combinatorics. What I will talk about today will be uh, combinatorial uh, complexes where you have a similar combinatorial description, but which comes from uh, computational models in distributed computing, where in, in this case, you will have a certain uh, computational model um, and um, which, which will be several processes. And the vertices will be the views of the various processes on the computation as it unfolds. And uh, the cells will be various executions. In the distributed computing, there will be not one pass of execution, but there will be several possible execution of the protocols by depending on uh, what happens because there is uncertainty in the, in the model. Anyhow, but this is like a general uh, view on, on just what, what we want to achieve. We want to have some sort of combinatorial uh, simplicial, in, in this case, it will be simplicial, combinatorial simplicial model, which we can uh, hopefully have purely mathematical questions which need to be answered, but which, which comes from, uh, the, from the field of distributed computing. So yeah, so this is just a slide with reference to this combinatorial direct topology. As you see, it's from 2008, so that's, long time ago. So today, uh, I want to go to distributed computing. And this is, a, this is an area which is, uh, well, I'll talk about this, uh, theoretical distributed computing. So theoretical distributed computing is an area in, within the theoretical computer science, just like complexity theory, other things. And so it grew in the 60s and the 70s uh, from the fact that one wanted to understand theoretical aspects of uh, computing in networks. Um, originally, uh, also in, uh, when, uh, in the chip design, because um, one wanted to know uh, what kind of operation you needed to you could um, implement a hardware level in the chips uh, to be able to compute certain things quickly and so on. So there's various models and uh, I'll just go through this so that, uh, uh, so certainly this, there are sick books written about this, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I hope to give you an impression of what I'm talking about here as application and then hopefully uh, be able to connect it to simplicial models. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, Byzantine failure. Well, I, can, uh, I wanted to go through the list, uh, but uh, Byzantine failure is uh, when uh, you're communicating with a processor and he delivers information which might be faulty. <laughs> right, so uh, that would be typical, for example, uh, if you open a, a newspaper, most of what you read. 
would be an example of Byzantine failure. Um, so, uh, so, so this, this is corrupted information, right? So uh, this, uh, the setting is like this. So you have uh, n processes which want to perform a certain task, and one thing which took me a while to understand all of this because I was coming uh, from a more classical field of theoretical computer science, which is uh, complexity theory. Uh, the computational power is not that important here, and so most of the tasks which you want to solve um, are in so some sort of agreement tasks between different nodes under a condition that they're, possi they're possible failures. So it doesn't really matter the computational power, but, you, you, but there's uncertainty. Anyhow, so you have end processes which want to perform a certain task. And then you have to choose a model of communication. And there are many, many choices you can make. So a classical choice of model of communication between uh, nodes is that you have a network, could be a complete network or maybe partial network. And uh, they communicate by means of message passing. So you can send, uh, so at uh, so the node I can send a message to node J with a certain content. Um, and there will be a list of axioms or conditions which may, may, may be satisfied depending on what you want to assume. So uh, just, I'm not gonna go into this because I look in a different model, but in the model of message passing, a typical axiom would be that if node I sends two messages in node J, then if they arrive, they arrive in the same order. But there is no guarantee, for example, that they arrive at all. But if they do, then they write in the same way. That would be typical. And there are other conditions like this, library conditions. So that's something people studied a lot. The other model of communication, which I want to talk about, for which there are good simplicial models, is so-called read-write communication. In this model, uh, you have a common register, which uh, as a processor communicate to, and each one uh, can perform one of the two operations. It can either write or read from the register. And there are choices you make. So this, since this is a very applied uh, area, you can you have a lot of choices you have to make, right? Because you make a model. So you can assume that um, they can they read they write only in their own uh, register and read from other registers. So immediate snapshot, for example, is the assumption where they they perform two operations. One operation is that the can write into the register whatever information they want to write there. And in the other operation is that they read the entire, uh, the entire list of uh, registers for all of them so, in, in one computational step. It's, it's important to say that they don't read it one by one because since we have a timing model at the same time, we don't want things to happen in the between, right? So this, there, you know, when you do this actual implementation, there is a, there is a notion of critical interval. And the critical, critical interval means that you do something and you assume that this, the next sequence of operations happens so fast that nothing else will happen in between. This is a critical interval. Because if things happen in between, you know, you read something, for example, typically you read something which is in some uh, cell, and then you may, in, some, in some register, and then you make your conclusions about it. But in the meantime, some other guy has written something else there, and then you do something things go wrong. Anyhow, so, and then there are other models where you assume other primitives, but like I said, we will not look at all. This is just a plethora of various models. And like uh, to the choice of possible failures, uh, the two standard ones will be either a crash failure or a Byzantine failure. So a Byzantine failure, we already discussed, this is sending corrupt information. A crash failure would be that um, the information may not arrive. So that's a simpler type of failure. So a typical example of, of a crash failure happens when a conference organizer asks for an abstract for the tour, right? And then you'll hear back. So you don't actually know, is he slow or did he crash, right? And, and then you have to make decisions under uncertainty. There's Byzantine failure is that he sends you a different abstract, right? So then of course it's easier to, uh, to agree on things, for example, with salt things when there are crash failures, then there are um, Byzantine failures. Typical protocols which will solve things uh, when there are Byzantine failures present would be majority voting uh, under assumption that a certain fraction is still healthy. Of course, if everything and under a certain degree of corruption as a whole network is, you, you cannot do anything. So, and then the different choice of timing models, asynchronous means that you do not have a synchronization between them and synchronous you do. Uh, more interesting is asynchronous, but um, um, 
then you have all these models. And then there is a, an area which I will not talk so much about, but in this area, people uh, uh, reduce one model to the other. So we're talking about impossibility results, one which tasks are solvable in which models. They will simply prove a bunch of theorems, which will say that if it's solvable in um, snapshot uh, model, then it's also solvable in this model and so on. So this is very helpful for a mathematician because then you can uh, work maybe hopefully with one model, which is a standard model, and whatever you prove about this will also be true for others because there is a step of computational re reduction of the other models to this model. So you're interested in the possibility results and also in uh, computational results, uh, like complexity, different types of complexity results. Okay, so I will only talk about this one standard model of communication, which I already started to define. The processes which I look at, uh, so this will be shared memory. So they, they write and read from a common register and each one writes whatever it wants. So uh, since it can write whatever it wants and we want to have estimates, we can simply assume that each time each processor writes its entire state there. So all, simply all information it has until this point, which in the beginning may be just whatever input value it has and um, its processor number. But as um, the communication goes on, it may write its state, whatever it has after a few rounds. And the snapshot read also, we discussed this means in one atomic step. Atomic step means um, nothing happens in between, it creates the entire state. We allow crash failures, and, um, and these protocols are asynchronous and uh, so called weight free, meaning that there is no upper bound on how long it takes to execute a step. So, and all executions are immediate snapshot, meaning that in each step, a group of processes becomes active, at which point all processes first write and then read together. So, um, and then also the executions are layered, meaning that uh, it's divided into rounds, and in each round, each non faulty process reads and writes exactly once. So, actually, uh, this can be reduced. So, uh, the, the bottom line is that um, all of this can be reduced to the model. Where you simply have a number of rounds, let's say 10 rounds, and in each round, uh, there is simply a division into groups of all the processors, and then within each group, they all read and all write. So, in what happens in each round is simply defined uniquely uh, indexed by uh, ordered partition of the set of processors. Okay, so, it will be easier for us to work with this because uh, you, can, you can make simplicial models for different. Uh, computational models, but they will not be as nice. The one you want to look at will be just a subdivision of a simplex, whereas these things will become more complicated topologically and it will be hard to say. At the same time, from the point of view of computation, they are used to each other. So just to give you like a toy example, uh, one such task would be assigning communication channels to the, uh, to the processes. So in this model, you have uh, the following situation. So let's say, let's, I mean, you can formulate it in different ways. You can formulate it, for example, as airplanes trying to land in the airport, uh, but I'll, I'll formulate it in terms of communication channels. So uh, in this task, um, you have a certain number of communication channels, which you want to assign to whichever agents show up um, up front. And the number of communication channels is rather limited. So I don't know, maybe you only have like five communication channels which you can use. And the number of uh, all possible agents which can show up could be in the millions. Mm -hmm. I mean, a whole database of clients. So uh, if you want to assign a unique communication channel to the client, your solution is not going to be that each client simply has a dedicated communication channel because there are many, many more clients than communication channels. The only hope you can have is that uh, there is a limit on how many of them show up at the same time, and then you distribute them. So, like I said, another model you could imagine would be that you have planes landing in the airport, and you have a certain number of landing strips. And I think it's customary to assign a unique uh, landing strip to each plane, which is trying to land, but there in, potentially in the world, there are many more flight numbers than there are landing strips. So you can only hope to do it for a few at a, at a time, and under these conditions of uncertainty, right? So they communicate like this. So each one 
And each round, each one uh, communicates whatever information it has. So in the beginning, it's just his flight number, but then maybe more, depending. And then he reads what the other wrote, and then he does the decision. So I don't know if two planes are arriving, and uh, he just communicates his, communicates his number. Then he reads, is there anybody there? For example, if he doesn't see anybody, he says, I'll take the street one. But that's what could be one protocol, right? And then if he sees, I see the other guy, I don't know, he can make a decision. Let's say two guys are arriving and then there are two, uh, two landing strips and uh, he just sees, if he sees the other guy, he's, he compares his flight number to the other guy. And then he says, if mine is small, I take the left one. If it's bigger, I take the right one. All right, so the problem is if, if it, it will not work like that because if they um, arrive at the same time and they both read and they both write, then they both see each other and they will distribute correctly between the landing strips. But in this model, we also allow for the possibility that first the first guy arrives and uh, then he, he does a step, two step, read, write, and then the second guy arrives and, and does read, write. So when the first guy arrives, let's say the first guy arrives and he has um, a, so, so as one of the, of the two who has a bigger number, he arrives first. Then he looks, but he doesn't see the other guy. So he doesn't actually know um, what the other guy's number is. So then he will pick the first lane. Then the second guy arrives and he sees the first guy and he sees that he has a bigger number. So he also picks the same lane. Of course, the second guy would need to know if the first guy saw him or not, but he cannot in this model. So he would have to go in another round and so on. Now in this model, we also assume the fresh memory, which means that after each round, the memory is erased. So each time the guy only sees what whoever wrote in this round. Of course, he has a memory himself. So he will see, let's say in the second round, he sees the other guy, he will also see what the first guy saw in the first round because he will write his entire statement. So potentially there is more information, but actually you can prove that it's, and the simplicial model is actually very easy to prove that if you have two guys arriving, they will never be able to solve it for two strips. So for two guys, you need three strips. And for the three strips, it will work with the protocol, which is uh, uh, here under the last point they can communicate like this in this model, which we're talking about, that they simply uh, read and write the number. And um, the first guy, so, so each guy, his protocol is like this. He looks in the memory and he doesn't see the other guy, he picks the first lane. But if he sees the other guy, he compares his uh, ID with the other guy, and then he picks either the second or the third, depending on what he sees. So this one will work, and this is actually optimal number of planes for two guys. And you can ask the same question for higher number, but I don't think this is known how many you need. Okay. The first examples of tasks, so just uh, list them so that you get a flavor. So you see they're quite different from uh, the tasks which appear in, in, in usual uh, complexity theory. So the standard task actually, which was uh, in the beginning of many of these things is so-called binary consensus, where each process starts with a value zero or one and eventually decides on zero or one as an output vector. And um, there are two conditions. So first of all, they need to come to a consensus. So they need to agree on the same value. And second, if all of them had the same value to start with, then they need to stick with that value. So without the second condition, you could write a very simple protocol because each one would simply decide zero, then they have a consensus. Right. But there is additional condition that if they have one to start with, then they need to actually come up with one. So that was actually at the, at the beginning of this uh, whole field of theoretical distributed computing because uh, they were designing various um, chips um, and uh, it, um, this result showed up formulated in a little bit different language, whereas they could prove that in uh, the computational model which they were implementing, uh, binary consensus is not solved under the asynchronicity, asynchronicity conditions which they had, uh, which is of course quite bitter because binary consensus is a very basic task. If you get, so basically, if you cannot solve binary consensus, then uh, you need to implement more primitives. Then this developed and people started to look at things like the K-set agreement and uh, it turned out that also quite interesting. And the K-set agreement tasks, they all have an input value 
and eventually we have to decide on the output value with the condition that uh, the total number of values which we have to decide in the end should be most k. Um, and at the same time, the only values you're allowed to pick uh, are the ones which were present in the, out, in the input values. So if you think about it, then one set agreement is actually binary consensus. So they have to decide on one, and they are not allowed to pick something which was not present in the And it turned out that um, even these things are not solvable. So if you have a hundred processes and uh, they all have very uh, certain, then they, they need to decide to agree on 99 consensus. So they have to somehow eliminate one value still, you can agree with them instead of one. Um, the last thing is the one um, which is, um, I will get to in the end, which leads to interesting questions about uh, uh, labelings of uh, vertices in simplicial complexes and triangulations of simplices. Um, it's called weak symmetry breaking. And in this task, um, it's an input list task. So processes have no inputs, just their IDs. And they need to pick uh, outputs from zero and one such that not all processes pick the same output. And they're only allowed to compare their IDs. So it should be a protocol, which is uh, ID compare based protocol. That's a standard requirement because uh, otherwise you could have protocols which refer to numerical values of the IDs of the processes, which is not something which makes sense. So they only can compare so that they can break the symmetry, but uh, they, right. And then you need to distribute them into two groups and each group should be non empty. Okay, so let's now uh, get out of this distributed stuff and uh, try to think simplicially. So uh, the simplicial complex is lurking um, in this whole in a, in this whole framework. So the first and the simplest uh, is a simplicial complex of initial configurations, so-called input complex. So I could have, let's think back to binary consensus. Let's say I have n processes. Each one has an input value zero or one. And I want to have a simplicial complex where vertices are all pairs of a processor and a possible input value. And the simplex is any consistent input value assignment. If you have no conditions, then any value assignment will be consistent. So uh, if you have n processes, each one can have zero, one, then you will have two n vertices in this, because you will have a vertex name of the process and zero or name of the process and one. And any collection will be consistent, except for one condition that each uh, processor can only have one input value. So you will have two n vertices, in which are in pairs, and any simplex is allowed, unless it contains one of the pairs. So if you think about this, this is just a, uh, a triangulation of a sphere. You can. Okay. The second simplicial complex which is present here is the output complex, which is constructed exactly the same way. So the vertices are all uh, names. Their names are name of the number of the processor and their output, its output value. And you have uh, a simplex if this configuration of output values is allowed. So in the binary consensus, uh, you will only have two simplices, one all zero, and uh, one simplex all ones. That's a simplicial complex as well. Then the interesting part, which depends on the model you assume, uh, will be a simplicial complex of all possible execution. So that's so called protocol complex. And this is actually the uh, center point of this whole development. So called protocol complexes. So the, in protocol complex, you construct like this. So um, each uh, process has an algorithm which it will perform, which in here is called protocol. It's just a name for it, for algorithm. So they have different protocols. In many models, they actually have the same protocol. And uh, then what you want is you want to have a simplicial model for all possible executions, which can happen if they perform their protocols. 
since uh, the timing is asynchronous, there are many different possibilities, who comes first and so on. So there are total number of executions. If you say limit number of, uh, um, of rounds, then there will be a certain number of executions which they can do. And you want to have a simplicial model for that. So in this model, the top dimensional simplices will be all possible executions. And the vertices will be all views of processes on what executions. Uh, what did the execution look like? Okay, so um, there are many, many different ways what the process I saw as the execution unfolded, and any set of consistent views will be uh, a simplex. And in this model, actually, one can also show that any set of consistent views can result in at most one execution. So either there is no execution which has these views, but if they're consistent, then there is at most one. You can uniquely backtrack the whole execution from what they saw, all, all of them together. So, um, I don't know. so th th this is this is very similar to uh, also there are different models uh, where people connected to logic, where you can have uh, say let's say you have uh, different the top dimensional simplices are uh, models of the world uh, or possible uh, philosophical models of the world. And but each one sees it in a different way. So you have local views of what things look like, and then uh, you have a simplex on a set of consistent views. So if there is a, uh, I mean, they can be inconsistent. So there is no model where they see these things at the same time. But if there is, then you put a simplex. It's kind of thing here as well. And then it becomes, then what you want to do is, of course, you want to have this is just to produce models for you know, um, input, output, and also for the execution. But then you want to do two things. So uh, if you, you need two more things. One thing you need to do is you need to specify a task. So you need to actually have a simplicial language to tell you what task you're looking at. So the things I was looking at before, for example, binary consensus or weak symmetry breaking, you need some sort of simplicial language to say what a task is, what is it that you want to, to achieve. And the other thing is you want to say simply is uh, that the protocol you designed will solve this problem. So you need two things like that. So the first is accomplished by so-called task specification map. And in this map, you simply, for each input, you simply want to say which are, what are legal outputs for this input. For each input, you want to say what are the legal outputs for this input. This is something, of course, this is actually the standard way without some additional copy. This is standard way the task will be specified on the student computing. So it's simply for each input, as they will tell you what are the legal outputs. It could be more than one. In a simplicial setting, it will not be a simplicial map, but it will be what's called a carrier map. So each simplex will map to a simplicial subcomputer. That's a task specification map. Then you will have another carrier map called execution map, which will go from the input complex to the protocol complex, which will take each input and map it to the subcomplex of all possible executions under this input. That's what's called execution map. Then there will be a decision map, which is simply shown, which for each execution, tell you what the output is. So when the execution ran, you will need to know. Now the answer is this. So for each execution, you say this is the output. And finally, there will be a commuting diagram. As in one of the previous talks, there was uh, mentioning that every topological there was commuting diagram. There is sort of commuting diagram here, not for simplicial maps, but for carry maps, but still. And it's a condition which will bind it together and will say that. Um, uh, this uh, protocol solves uh, this task, which will involve the spe task specification, decision, and execution maps. Did you? Yes. Did you say the carrier maps need not be simplicial? Well, they might be, but uh, in general, the carrier map will send a simplex to a subcomplex. Simplex to a subcomplex. Right. There are more conditions than scale, but in, in general, it's, yeah. But they all do the same dimension and so on. It's the same dimension. They will go the pure. Yeah, in general, carrying that, it could map just a single, simple, um, single simplex, but in general, simple. Yes. Yeah, because, uh, because it, I mean, we're not making it up, right? Because we have to, we're trying to do, these things exist, and these things got studied by these people. They don't actually need us. 
So, and then uh, you, you can make a different model, but it will not what they care about. Right, so, so but you really want to model for each input, unfortunately, there could be more than one output, which is equal, right? So going back to, um, I don't know, binary consensus, if you have a, in a simplex in the, uh, in, in the input complex, which has both zeros and ones in it, then either one of the outputs, the synthesis will be allowed. But if they're all zeros and only one is one, so, so you will have to map one simplex to, to two because they're both. Right, so actually that's exactly the next slide. That's very convenient. Um, <coughs> so it's a simple issue uh, for the binary consensus. You, as an input input complex, you will have this complex which we were talking about, which is a subdivision, standard subdivision of uh, the first one, um, subdivision subdivision of, of a sphere. If you want to make one, the first one you, you make is, well, not the simplex itself, but the one with the Z2 action, um, that will be the one. And um, the output complex consists of two disjoint simplices. And uh, the, uh, this, is, this is a task specification map is exactly what we were just talked about. So if they're all zeros and it's a single simplex with zeros, if they're all one and it's a single, single simplex with ones, but if they're both present, then it, there's a union of the two. So to the protocol complexes, and this is important here, um, the model for the protocol complexes for this round model is the following. So, um, let me just uh, switch now to the combinatorial language and say you tell you what the uh, simplicial complex is, and then uh, with some work one can connect it back to the distributed setting and see how this is correct. So uh, the, the complex, and in fact this complex appeared in many different contexts um, in, in various uh, situations before, also in the work of Tom. Somebody sent me a reference to some old paper of Tom, um, in which where this kind of um, subdivisions appeared in, in also like topology, but here's the pure natural as um, protocol complexes for this uh, for this uh, one round uh, protocols. And this is what we call standard chromatic subdivision. And in this subdivision, you take a simplex and um, rather than doing the very centric subdivision, which would put only one vertex on each uh, um, simplex, you put uh, several ones. Uh, what you do is you take the very center of each um, simplex in your, in your, as a boundary simplex, it's a smaller dimensional simplex, very center. And then you shift it towards uh, the end vertices in all possible ways. So on the edge, for example, here, I don't know, is there a pointer in this one? Could we know? In the middle. Ah, perfect. Okay, so then uh, it's green. Okay. So, uh, so for example, here there should be dark center in the middle of the edge, but rather you move it one way here and one way here, and then you have these two vertices. And here too, you should have a dark center, but then you move it one way in each direction. You, you move it opposite to the always opposite. So actually, it's a bit confusing. But here, this one is coming from this vertex. This one. Anyway, and then there is a way you can describe how. So uh, the simplest way to describe it is to simply give a combinatorial description of all the vertices and all the uh, simplices. Okay. So the definition I can tell you what it is, is the following. The uh, vertices, so you have n elements, in this case, zero, one, and two. Okay, so three, n is equal to three here. In fact, in this case, as we here, n is equal to two. Anyhow, so uh, you have three vertices and then the vertices are all possible subset of the set of the vertices with one of the elements chosen. Okay. So in the barycentric division, vertices are just subsets. Right. And here it's subset with one of the elements chosen. Okay. And the, the top dimensional simplices like I said, it will be all ordered partitions of the set of the vertices. So for example, the middle uh, triangle will correspond to just a uh, ordered partition consisting of one single block where zero, one, and two are all together, but look up together. 
and then uh, this one will correspond to a, uh, a order partition where you have two blocks. The first block is zero and the second one is one, two. This uh, is just combinatorial, this is just combinatorial labels. They correspond to executions, but if you don't care about executions, we don't have to care. This are just, uh, this is how it is. So each top dimensional simplex, just the ordered partition of the labels. Okay. If you want to tell what is the, what are the vertices, all you do is you simply pick a, the vertex you want, one of the elements, and then you take the union of all the blocks, which, uh, can, uh, which are to the left, of this block. So if your ordered partition is zero, one, two, and then you can either pick zero and it will only see zero itself. It will be zero, zero, it will be uh, this one, or you can pick one, but then it will see all three, zero, one, two. So that will be uh, one of these two. And the other one will be two and the set is zero, one, two. Okay. So that's uh, called, we call it thematic subdivision because uh, Unlike the very settings of division, if you color the vertices, you can easily extend the same number of colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, on the, on the left, of course, that's what happens when you have two guys. Okay. And uh, the way it's formulated, you can immediately see that it's, inherit, it's, it's inheriting on the boundary, it's inherits each other. So uh, what happens on the boundary is exactly just the same as if it the settings of division, it's the lower dimensional one. So because of this, you can iterate it. So in other words, what I see here, I would call it the first standard chromatic subdivision of the triangle. And I can repeat it again and get the second uh, chromatic subdivision and so on. The same I can do for this. So I will have a three edges. In the second one, I will have nine edges because I will do the same to each one of the three and so on. So I'll have just an edge, which is subdivided right, three to the n smaller edges. The triangle will have a higher number. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, I'm not quite saying why this is the weight free layer that we didn't have to start. Ah, okay. Yeah, so that, that you see is a, is a you know, that, but, uh, well, okay, so, um, but that's not actually, uh, so this is a mathematical model. If we don't care about the supercomputing, we don't care about it. Right. And so, yeah, but how to connect it back? All right. So, like I said, so each execution, so let's say the middle, uh, the middle, uh, let's take the middle triangle. So that corresponds in my labeling to just a single block, zero, one, two. In the execution model, it corresponds to the one possible execution in which all of them arrive simultaneously. This triangle here will have ordered partition label zero. And then another uh, block one, two. It corresponds to the execution where first the guy whose name is zero arrives. And after that, the guys who names is one and two arrive simultaneously. All right. And there are, for three guys, there are 13 possibilities. In general, uh, it's called the bell number, weighted bell number, whatever, it's exponentially growing, double exponentially. It's a very large number of all possible executions, even in the first step. In fact, the, for the weak symmetry breaking, the most interesting case, the first interesting case is for six processes because it's a first non prime power. And uh, so even in the first execution, the number of uh, synthesis will be enormous. And one is interested in the third one. So one talks about millions of them actually very quickly. So these are small models. Okay, so that, that's how it connects, okay? And uh, so this is one round execution. So these are triangles are possible executions. Vertices are possible views. So if I have a vertex here whose label is two and then subset of the total set zero, two, and I read process number two, so zero and two during the execution. Each processor saw himself, but he also may or may not have seen someone else. This is how it connects back. Okay. If you repeat the rounds in the execution, then you just do an iterated subdivision. Yeah. You can repeat the subdivision, or iterate it. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think so. I have two more things, but okay. So I have 
I think I'll skip one of the two things. So I have a, as, um, I have a description of the of the whole model, uh, and I also have the weak symmetry breaking. But I really want to go to the weak symmetry breaking because this is where we still have open problems, which we can complete mathematically. And um, so let me let me go to this, all right? Because I want to get to some mathematical question at <laughs> some point. So um, I think the best way is that I will just do it on the slide. Okay. So let me um, formulate uh, let me formulate the question directly, and then we can kind of. So I just okay. So I want to formulate now a mathematical question, okay, which does not involve distributed computing. And then we can connect it back and see what's wrong. The mathematical question is as follows. I take uh, a simplex, an N simplex, okay, in this case, a triangle. Okay. And I can uh, do uh, as the, the class I'm looking at are simplices, um, which I have chromatically subdivided a number of times. So a T iterated chromatic subdivision of an N simplex. Okay, this is the stuff I'm looking at. So let's say triangle, which I subdivided a few times. Okay. And I want to know, do I have a certain zero one labeling on the vertices? Yes or no? Okay. The condition on the zero one labeling is the following. The first condition is that I will have no top dimensional simplex, in this case, triangle, where all of the labels are the same. I will have no monochromatic top dimensional synthesis. Okay. And the second condition is okay. Um, let me first say what it is for a triangle. The second condition for a triangle will, will say this the following the labels of the uh, vertices in the corners are the same. The three vertices have the same label. And the labels on the edges um, are connected in the following way. So I label the quarter vertices. Let's call this one, uh, let's order them. Let's say this is the first one, this is the second one, this is the third one. And then orient edges always from the smaller one to the larger one. So it goes from this to this, from this to this, and from this to this. And then my condition is that the labels on the edges will be the same if I read them in this direction. Okay. So in general, if you have an N simplex, if I take any two simplices, any two boundary simplices of the simplex with the same number of vertices, okay, and I ordered the simplices, uh, sorry, I ordered the vertices of the whole simplex, there is a unique identification between two boundary simplices of the same dimension, which respects the linear order of the vertices. Okay. And my condition is that my labeling should respect that. So on each smaller dimensional simplex, the labels read should be the same if I identify with this thing. So there are two ways to formulate this condition. Either as I did with a simplex, and this condition on the boundary, or I could start by gluing together. I could start not with the triangle, but I could glue together. I would say I have a triangle. I identify all three corners into one uh, vertex, and then I identify the edges in this arrow dimension. So the arrow going from here to here, and then we're going from here to here, and then we're going from here to here. I'm sure you saw it in some textbooks in topology. Can you glue it together? And then you have a new topological space, which will be more complicated than just the simplex. And that you can do with any simplex. So I, I could take any simplex and identify. So I will have a semi simplicial set where I will have only one um, simplex in each dimension because I identify them all, right? which is then T fold subdivided by zero. One. And the question is do I or do I not have such a zero one labeling corner? So that question is equivalent to asking, can I or can I not solve the symmetry breaking in two rounds? Because of this formulation actually, or mathematically, you can easily see that 
if you have such a label for some t, so let's fix m. If for some subdivision, let's say a triangle, if there is a some subdivision of a triangle for which I can find such a label, I will also be able to extend it to all higher ones. Something you can kind of easily show uh, with this combinatorial model or trivially show from computer science because it's obvious to any computer scientist that if you can solve it in two rounds, then you can solve it in any higher number of rounds. But for with this model, you have to you know say what the labels are the new ones of but it's not. Okay. So the, so the answer to this question is no. Uh, the, the answer is okay. The answer to the, so okay. So this leads to the question for which n can you find it at all for some t, right? So that would be a question: can you solve the big symmetry break for n processes? And that one is actually known. And the answer is you can solve big symmetry breaking if and only if the number of um, processes is not a prime power. Okay, so that's uh, that's a theorem um, in theoretical. Uh, so that's a theorem by Herrlich and Schmidt, uh, which have proved um, in the, some time ago, maybe twenty years ago, that you can solve it if and only if um, the, the the it's not a prime power. The next question is how many rounds do you need? Okay, so let me uh, maybe go through. I'm sorry, I will have to go through some slides which I didn't want to. Talk now because I want to get to some. Okay. So this is initial formalization, which we didn't go through. Anyhow, so just because I, before I go through, so this is a, as a book on this topic. It's called "Theory of Computing Through Combinatorial Topology," which appeared in 2014, uh, which is by um, two co-authors of mine and myself. And the two other persons are in uh, computer science. Right. And uh, anyway, so let me just get to something which I can talk about. Um, Right, so maybe from this point of view, this is this is just repeating what I said already, just with uh, with uh, terminology. Uh, sorry, with with, uh, with with notation. Okay, so uh, uh, so a, a labeling on the uh, you see this is uh, simplex. This is the T uh, chrom uh, standard chromatic subdivision, and the labeling on the vertices um, is called compliant uh, if um, if it satisfies this condition I was talking about. So if you identify boundary simply of the same dimension and the same. So like I said, might, you might as well label the things in this convoluted topological space if you want to. And so and the main goal is then to find this compliant uh, labels. Okay. Right. So this is just uh, formalizing what I said already in words. Okay. Um, there is a theorem of Hermich and Shabit, which said that you can do it even only if um, well, actually, okay. So actually, the whole theorem, uh, what I said is actually Helix and Shavit and um, I forget this uh, theorem. Uh, so they proved it's impossible uh, if it is a prime power, and Castaneda and Reisbaum proved that it's actually possible if it's not a prime power. So then you can ask the question: Is so you can concentrate on prime power, not prime power? So the first one is six. And you can ask yourself, what is the value of t which you need? Because that would be a question of round complexity for the protocols. Okay. So, uh, oops, sorry. So the known upper bounds uh, uh, due to Atia, Castaneda, and um, uh, was uh, that uh, the t is at the order of magnitude of n to q plus five, where q is the largest prime power dividing n, so potentially it could be uh, close to n itself. Uh, in particular, for six, uh, there would be 17 rounds, um, which, and there's actually, it's just a theoretical proof, there's no protocol, which is still the case, even in from my side. Anyhow, and uh, so maybe I finish with this. So uh, five or six years ago, yeah, we were able to prove uh, something quite interesting. Um, namely, that if you do have, um, if there exists such an identity of binomial uh, coefficients, so a, sum, a certain sum of binomial coefficients is equal to certain other sum of binomial coefficients with almost no conditions, almost no conditions. Um, if you have that, then you can actually solve the weak symmetry breaking in three rounds. Okay. 
So the conditions are written here. So you just have the sum and then uh, this A is here. These are binomial conditions. So this A is uh, between uh, 2 and N, well, between 3 and N minus 1. And B1 is between 2 and N minus 1, uh, if that exists. So that would be an example of such an identity. What is this here? I think this is the first two. Uh, if you have it, then actually you can uh, solve it very, very rapidly with a weak symmetry breaking, namely only in three rounds, which is quite an unexpected result because there is an infinite number of uh, values of n for which you have such an identity. We cannot characterize the set, we don't know what they are, but we know, for example, that all the multiples of six uh, belong to the set. So for each multiple of six, we can pro uh, produce such an identity. And so it means that there is an infinite number of values of how many processes there are in which you can solve it in a constant time, in a constant number of rounds. And it is uh, unknown what is in general the case. Can you always solve it in a constant? So actually there is a, some, some schism there. So I think yes, but uh, Morris thinks no, Morris here that he's so. Um, anyhow, so that's, uh, the rest will be just details of this proof, but I think I, think I should stop here. And that's, that's it. Are there any questions? So you mentioned the, the community and distributing computing. Do they use uh, these kind of protocols uh, from coming from superficial contexts? Get out of it. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, is, is they don't use it because there are no protocols which come out of it. This is a short answer. So, so first of all, these theorems which I told you about, they prove them using similar language. So it's not like they didn't know or care about simplicial complexes and then you know they, they saw the light that's not like this they actually do so all of these proofs are like this they look at the simplicial complexes they look at things which they thought were subdivisions they couldn't prove it but they thought there were subdivisions and so on so, so first of all this whole uh, context has been present even prior to our work in the distributed computing okay then it's a question of what is a protocol okay so, so protocol is so just so that people people get confused, including myself, for a long time. The protocol is just an algorithm. It's just a word we use for an algorithm in distributed setting. Okay, and we are used to um, algorithms uh, formulated in a verbal way. So, like I in my example of landing strips, I had a protocol, and my protocol said, "I do that, then I do that, then if I see this, I compare, and then my choice is this." Okay, this is what you think should be a protocol, but that's not how these things are proved, because once you formulate them mathematically, like this, with labelings of this, for example, we can show, um, as, follow, as a special case of this theorem, that for a five simplex, if you give me a five simplex, you have six vertices, and you take the third chromatic subdivision of this, which will have an enormous amount in thousands of vertices and in the millions of simplices, then I will be able to find a labeling. Okay, so fortunately, it's not like a probabilistic proof or something like that. So we can actually construct a labeling. I can actually construct some complicated procedure, which starts with some labeling and then starts to fix it by using various uh, results from matching theory and so on. And eventually, it kind of gets to some labeling. And then the question is, then what? Okay, because then you have this labeling, and basically after this, I can write the protocol. And my protocol will, will be very, very, very long. And each line of this protocol will be the following. If I'm processor I, and I have seen this, this, and this, this is my view, then I decide zero. The next line will say, if I'm processor this, and I see this, and I decide one. So I can translate it to a protocol, but it will be extremely long protocol. So formally it is salt, but it's not, I believe their word for this is natural protocol, which you would usually associate with an algorithm, which would like a verbal description which would not be of the links of, uh, I don't know, 16,000 lines or something like that. For a single, for just for six, not for N. For N, it would depend on N, the length of the protocol. 
So uh, you have formally a protocol, but uh, for some people, they'll say, no, they need a natural protocol. But there is no real formalization of what a natural protocol is. You can have different conditions and so on. And so, so yeah, so uh, the answer is uh, no. Producing explicit protocols from these results is actually uh, a matter of research. And it's kind of mysterious. And also, it's very strange because uh, and from the point of view of uh, symmetry breaking, it shouldn't matter if you have six or seven processes, but it does. Other questions? Can we use these techniques to get some lower bounds on communication complexity? Well, what do you mean by communication complexity? How much? How much? You're solving not tensors, but trying to work maybe or something, right? How much data you need? Um, so, so I, I think, uh, so in these models, usually there is no, uh, you do not take into account how much data you send in one step. Uh, so you, you can use it to uh, get bounds on how many times you send things. But it doesn't take into account what you have to do locally, and it also doesn't take into account how much you send. But it will, like I said, like how many rounds will you need to solve something? Yes. Yeah. Well, this might be off topic, but uh, is this uh, is there a connection between this distributed uh, computing and random computing? <laughs> I haven't looked for one. I'm sure. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Dimitri again. And I believe next we have uh, two parallel sessions. Coffee break. And Coffee break. And when, what time do the parallel sessions start? Four. 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 Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.